Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. Today, we're talking about Blonde, a fictionalized take on the life of Marilyn Monroe. The film, which is currently airing on Netflix, is an adaptation of a novel by Joyce Carol Oates, and Ana de Armas plays the lead. My guests are the hair and makeup team. Jamie Lee McIntosh, you are the head of the hair department. Welcome to Below the Line. Thanks. And Tina Racer Kerwin, you are the head of the makeup department. Nice to have you here as well. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. I'm happy to have you both here. I think this is going to be a fun conversation. A warning for listeners, it may contain spoilers, so be warned. So first, tell me about how this project came together, how you got involved, and when actual filming took place. I was recommended to Andrew Dominic, the director, by um, makeup artist Jean Black, who he had worked with on previous films. So I went in and interviewed with him while he walked around and showed me hundreds of photos of Marilyn and what he was visually wanting to see. And I was just soaking it all up. Um, And then he just about three quarters of the way turned around and said, "Um, so can you do Marilyn here or what? (laughs) <laughs> and I was just like, uh, I, I think so. <laughs> um, and he's like, all right. <laughs> and that was that. Well, Jamie, we will come back to that challenge of uh, doing Marilyn, as as he put it. Tina, tell me how you got involved. I got involved through the first AD and producer, Scott Robertson. We had recently worked together and for some reason he thought I should be part of this. Gene was originally on it and then they shut down for a little bit and then Gene's schedule got complicated with Brad. And so I came to the the project a little bit later, but it was through my relationship with Scott. So that's how I got to it. And I had a similar experience with my interview with Andrew, just the walls of the production conference room were covered with hundreds and hundreds of images. And it was in scene order. And it wasn't always Marilyn, but it was images that was, it was like the biggest mood board you've ever seen. It was just images that set the tone for a certain scene. And so he walked me around this and it was a lot from the very, very beginning. (laughs) And it never stopped being a lot. (laughs) You know, that's interesting. So it sounds like the entire production was trying to get in the space of capturing Marilyn Monroe. But obviously the hair makeup is going to be central roles in bringing this to reality. Talk to me about your approach to this iconic look. I think for me, it just really started with actually getting to know Marilyn because I I I knew who Marilyn Monroe was, of course, and Norma Jean, and I'd seen images, but I wasn't a diehard Marilyn fan. So I had a lot of research to do. I will say um, someone's probably going to shoot me, but I'd never seen any of her films. <laughs> so it was a hard and fast um, crash course on all things Marilyn. But also because Andrew had such a clear vision in his mind of what he wanted to see, it was narrowed down for me to be able to know exactly what we were recreating, how much we were going to be recreating, so I just kind of took Andrew's lead on that. I, I think when I came on, uh, I felt um, I had some knowledge of Marilyn, but I, I'm like Jamie Lee. I wasn't a diehard fan. And there was a, I think there's a little bit of that that was actually helpful because I, I did have locked in my brain what had to be or what should be. I just knew s- some information and then kind of felt like I was jumping on a moving train and and had to very quickly through the images that the director had given us, figure out, you know, how to prioritize things. And then because Andrew and Anna had done a test before, they sort of figured out a few things that we both learned is in that the, the wigs were pale enough and the hair, her hair was dark enough that there needed to be a fix in order for those wigs to look good. And Jamie Lee was on board with that. And so then together we figured out that in order to cover Anna's dark hair, then we were going to need, you know, a bald cap or, or, or a prosthetic or something like that. So we ended up, you know, through some trial and error using three fusion effects, uh, prosthetic silicone transfers in order to cover her hairline. 
Um, so there was one on each side and then one on the back that went down the middle and it would give us a completely skin like surface for all of Jamie Lee's wigs to sit on. So that was, that was one of the first things that we did technically. And then, you know, minimizing and, and lightening on us brows was the next technical thing that we did. And then it was just testing and jumping into a, a really enormous amount of images that, that we were going to try and recreate. We shot for 45 days and we did over a hundred looks. If that gives you the, you know, that math alone tells you anything. So it's one of the reasons why we needed prosthetics under the wig because a regular ball cap wouldn't hold up to wig changes in the middle of the day. So anyway, we started with some of the technical stuff and then kind of leapt into the, the masses of images we were recreating. So you bring up a point I want to follow up on. And so there are the dramatic scenes, uh, but there's also a lot of recreation of her photography and the film roles. And so all of that you're shooting from scratch. None of that is just sort of digital work. You guys are making that look every time. Yes. We recreated <laughs> looks from the very young Norma Jean when she was a brunette and then through her sort of path to find her look of Marilyn. All those images we recreated and we shot. Yeah. Every like every picture that you see, the um, newspaper cutouts that she gives her mum to look at in the hospital and all that type of stuff, there is not one on a face digitally put on a Marilyn head and body. So it's all completely, we did all those photo shoots. Yeah, that's a lot of work. It was, it was an <laughs> enormous amount of work. And in fact, it was so much work that, I don't think anybody thought we'd get through it, including Netflix. Um, <laughs> so, but we did. Um, and because Andrew, Andrew had been working on this in his head for almost 10 years. And so not only did he have a clear vision of what he wanted, he had a clear stack of images that he wanted to reproduce. And he had, he just, his clarity was, was r really refreshing in a lot of ways and also unwavering. So, <laughs> you know, these are what we're going to do. And these are what we did. And um, we did quite a few. There was actually some that we did that didn't even make the film because we had so many. It was a challenge. Yeah, it's an insane challenge. Tina, you mentioned uh, Scott Robertson, who was a producer and the first AA in this. I know Scott. I worked with him back on Elizabeth Town of the Day. And I also know his uh, key second, Aaron Fitzgerald. How did those guys contribute to like, all of this coming together and, and really trying to meet the schedule that you've described? Um, I think for me... Aaron will always be in my life as like a savior. <laughs> <laughs> he's so calm and he's so lovely and he just wants to help and do whatever he can to make it happen. So sweet and just so helpful. He would just do anything to try and help us achieve what we needed to achieve. And you could go to him with anything. He was just like our solid rock of good guy. He was, he was often the bearer of bad news, yeah. but, but um, he, he always did it in a way that he, you always felt like he's like, I get it. This is not good, but here's what we're going to do. And he would always sort of take whatever it was and he would spin it into you're like, okay, Aaron, we'll do that for you because you're so awesome, you know? <laughs> and it was, it was, there was a point when it felt like, you know, as, as much as we appreciate Scott and, you know, love working with him, it felt a little bit, there were days where it was like good cop, bad cop, you know? Um, because unfortunately Scott had to make the tough decisions. And unfortunately for Aaron, he had to deliver the, these decisions sometimes about, you know, how many more scenes we're doing or how many changes we're having, or that we don't have time for this or that or whatever, or that, you know, I know you needed, you know, 20 minutes and you have two and, you know, just whatever that is. And I don't think either one of them realizes how much collectively they were supporting, you know, each other. But Aaron was so great at just making you want to whatever it was he asked. You don't want to make Aaron cry. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think even Scott understood how much you know, smoothing over and, 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 you know, making bright and happy that Aaron was doing and, you know, the song and dance that Aaron is doing in the, you know, base camp. I don't think anybody knew, you know, except us and maybe costumes. They were a great team. You know, there was, there was a lot of impossible task and they helped us pull it through. We yeah. couldn't have done it without that 
teamwork. Yeah. Um, they were great. And I mean, Scott was up against it big mm-hmm. time. Like that schedule was, you would have thought it was impossible. I mean, I've never had an AD tell me that I cannot do a wig change for continuity because I do not have time. And we'd got the wig changes down to seven minutes and that was too long. He was just like, we don't have time for it. And, you know, you just talk to the director about it. It's okay. Don't worry. It'll be all right. And you just trust them all and walk away and go, well, shit. Okay. We'll see how this turns out. (laughs) Wow. Tell me what other sort of challenges you guys were facing in the day-to-day execution on this. Well, time in general, schedule. Time and money. Money. It's always time and money, isn't it? I mean, trying to create as many looks as we did with the few wigs that I had, I would have loved probably twice as many wigs than, than what I did have because trying to push and pull a couple of wigs into so many styles every day is um, sometimes it works in your favor and sometimes it does not. <laughs> there were definitely times when, you know, there, there. in fact, we actually pulled it up on our phone because Anna had never seen it. There's this old Dunkin' Donuts commercial <laughs> where this guy is saying time to make the donuts and he goes out the door and then he comes, you know, I made the donuts and out the door making the donut. I made, and then at one point he runs into himself going in and out the door. <laughs> and that's how we felt some days, you know, because I actually pulled up for Anna and she, she'd never seen it. it was hysterical, you know, because there, our days were long because we had a, you know, a couple hours in the morning to put her together. And then we had time in the evening to take her apart and, and half the time, it's just the three of us are there in the trailer and we are, you know, punch drunk and tired and, you Not know. Not knowing where the day finishes. Yeah, it, definitely. <laughs> I mean, we probably should have just put up, you know, beds in the trailer and we would have gotten more sleep. But there was definitely days when, you know, they were just like, how are we ever going to get through this? <laughs> but there was also those moments when we would actually accomplish something and we go oh okay that that looks like the picture that we go okay great wonderful next you know and it, and it, we would just move on to the next one because there were certainly days that all we were doing is just checking the boxes you know and some days we were doing looks that we were only doing that day and we'd never do them again and we hadn't done them before so it was yeah. the first time and you've got 10 minutes to figure it out <laughs> so especially some of the younger stuff you know that was telling her you know, her path, some of those we'd never done. And and we were just moving at lightning speed. We were changing her, you know, she had a tent on stage. So she, we went into the tent, she changed hair, makeup, costume out again, and hair, makeup, costume and out again. And we were flying through looks on some days. So it's quite a bit. Speaking of the looks, something else I noticed about this film is that it it uses a lot of different visual styles. Sometimes it's black and white. Sometimes it's these soft, close-ups. I know that those choices do affect how hair and makeup come across. I'm curious how that played out as a, another complication on this shoot. We wouldn't always know how they're going to shoot it. Oh so my. for us. <laughs> no fault of our own. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Best kept secret. <laughs> yeah. We're like, surprise. <laughs> we might some days know black and white or color, but we might not know past that. And during some of the pre-production, when we were doing all these photographs, I had a chance to try a, just a ton of lip colors. So I knew kind of which ones worked better in black and white and color. But there's a lot of times we didn't know how they were going to shoot it. So we just always assumed that it was going to be close up and it was going to need to match as close as possible and be prepared for anything. Yeah. So wigs came to set, lipsticks came to set. We, you know, my makeup bag was the biggest I've ever had in my life because I had her lifetime of lipsticks with me every day because just in case. It almost felt like we had two call sheets. The one that we were, everyone was seeing and sort of like the secret one. It was like, oh, we were going to do this too, you know? And we're like, ah, you know, it was, it, it was a lot. So we we weren't always uh, prepared in the moment. We but we got there really quickly. Yeah, they know. also did this thing um, that they started referring to, and I don't know if other film sets do have done this, but um, I hadn't come across it before. It was fifty fifty. So <laughs> it's like what fifty <laughs> fifty? Tell me more. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that on set either. Yeah, so they yeah they would start rolling, and you'd just quietly start hearing fifty fifty, and it's just like oh fuck, they're shooting. 
And it didn't matter if there was kind of crew in the shot. Some of the crew had been dressed. So if they happened to be in shot, it was okay. But it was just like, you know, we rely heavily sometimes on our last looks. So, you know, there's normally a rhythm of how things go that, you know, you might leave something uh, to do on set last minute because you don't have time they're pulling around the trailer whatever whatever um and then they start shooting and you're like what they're rolling right now you ca- i can't go in ah okay yeah. <laughs> you know and, and and we got as close as we could before we left the trailer because we just we began to understand that rolling could happen the minute she walked in the door mm. because we were on a film set, um, set and they were shooting a film set and we had a lot of you know antique cameras and lighting and everything else around and there was crew that was dressed period um hair and makeup costumes and everything you just had to be aware you just had to be sort of oh because we didn't have time to do that ourselves our assistants you know on some days would do it so we just would just sort of duck away and go she's yours <laughs> you know <laughs> so but i think what ended up happening in doing that is that you got an essence of Marilyn on set that was different than you would have gotten otherwise. So there was some of this behind the scenes stuff was really behind the scenes stuff. I mean, it was actually what was happening. It was really interesting and terrifying way to shoot. (laughs) Not to take anything away from Scott and his team and the schedule, what they're trying to do. The film comes together. It looks great, but I would think his hair and makeup that I would be a little surprised. Like, again, getting the look of Marilyn Monroe, were you surprised that it wasn't, I don't know, sort of scheduled around given the importance to the entire project of your work? Wouldn't have that made sense? Wouldn't have that been smart? (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. You know what? I don't know if it was a scheduling thing or Netflix just didn't hand up the cash to have enough shooting days. I'm going to just throw it back at Netflix and say maybe it was a budget <laughs> thing because, I don't know, Scott, they, they had so many things that they needed to do in such little time. So Now, I know Netflix is having money issues now, but you guys shot this back in 2019 and they had all the money in the world back in 2019, if I remember Yeah, correctly. but it's also so. a risky, it's not a family-friendly movie. No, you know no, it's I mean? not. That's, yes, that's I know where exactly money what you goes, <laughs> you know? So I think it was a risk for them to take it on in the first place, yeah. maybe. So... I'm just talking out my ass yes. now. Really, <laughs> about childhood trauma. Maybe don't necessarily make the top of the list of um, Netflix shows. I don't know. Um, maybe it will now because it's Marilyn's childhood trauma. So I, I don't know. It's it's hard to know. And in, in the moment, all you know is here's the list. Here's the time frame. Go and high, high expectations, not only high expectations from Andrew, the director and Scott, the, you know, first AD producer, but all the Marilyn fans, all the people who know what Marilyn looks like and every inch of her face and her hair and her body and her costumes, high expectations from all of that crowd as well. And there was people that knew about the film and they were, we can't wait to see, and we can't wait to see. And, and so you know, it's, 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 she's a legend. And not only is it an amazing opportunity, it's also a huge responsibility to get it right. Yeah. It's nerve wracking as hell. (laughs) You don't want to mess it up. You don't want to mess up an icon. You know, this man's been, you know, Andrew has been waiting to do this movie for 10 years and you're the reason it's not working. No, you can't, you know, and Anna has worked so hard on, you know, her accent and how she shapes her words and everything. And then you're the reason it's not where, no, you can't be that. You can't be that. You have to get it right. And so we just leaps of faith on a regular basis. We just jumped in and did it. (laughs) Crossed our fingers and did it. And we talked a lot about your work creating Marilyn Monroe. But talk to me about some of the other characters in the film. Did you even have time? Time, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> Julianne Nicholson, who plays Gladys, we, that, she was actually the first person that we, um, not we, but I tested early on. Because Andrew really wanted to understand how we can have that time jump and see her older and how that's going to work on Julianne and all that type of stuff. So that was the first thing that he kind of wanted to have a play around with. So that was cool to be able to kind of test those waters then. So I had a pretty good idea of what direction to go with for her. And then everybody came in or a lot of the people came in 
prior to shooting so that we can have a look at them and see what they needed and go through a little bit of, you know, uh, we're going to do this and we want to do this and things like that. So we had a little time with them in advance while we were trying to figure out Maryland. And we did have support from our team. And so we would decide what it is we wanted or what we needed. And then they would, you know, do a test and then Andrew would approve or not. And then we would make changes if we needed to and go through it like that. So without on the day they were shooting, when they arrived, we had worked most of that out. Um, that wasn't for every character, but it was for quite a few of them. And I have to give a shout out to an amazing Jamie Lee creation of a comb over. <laughs> It I was is, like, where is she going with this? It's the best <laughs> come over. It's so good. You didn't know it wasn't real. Um, well, you shouldn't even know. It I mean, is, you, you should never know. That's true. <laughs> but it's so good. I'm pitching to you now, Jamie Lee. Uh, I've set you up to tell us about this amazing comb over. Because I'm not, honestly, it was it was so weird looking when it was on the block. But when, you, when it went on, you're like, this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it, so it was on Dan Butler, who plays her um, manager slash agent. So often when you do period films, I mean, fashion has changed so much for guys. Like they start receding or thinning or losing hair on top and they will just kind of buzz the whole thing off the comb over has kind of you know there's only a few gents left in the world that are trying to do the comb over and they're probably in their 80s or 90s so I just really wanted to see that in the film so yeah I just had a um I, I didn't even do the measurements I think I emailed Dan and I was just like he sent me photos and I said, I put markings on his photos and I was just like, can you measure from here to here and tell me how many inches that is? And then I just had a delicate little piece made that we glued onto one side and had the hair comb over the top of his scalp, over the top of his head. And um, he loved it. I think he thought I was a little bit crazy at first, but once he saw it, he was just like, oh yeah, this is cool. You're going to have to, <laughs> now you're going to want to go back and have a look at that. <laughs> now you're going to go, wait a second, where did I miss the comb over? Now, it's, when you mentioned the comb so over, I remember it. It didn't grab my attention at the time because it works very much it as it the time period. And that's, you know, you're not looking for extra attention, but I will encourage our listeners. Yeah, go watch it again and sort of look for those nuances in character that maybe you didn't notice before. Yeah. And, you know, when you do a period film, you know, you, you want to have, you know, all the background go through, you know, makeup and hair and costumes so that they all look appropriate as well. So we had a couple of premieres. We had a couple of, you know, people in the uh, scenes with people in the movie theaters we had you know different times where we had all these background even um in diamonds are a girl's best friend and then some like it hot we had background that were you know on camera as well um i mean like from the band and from the dancers and so there was times that we are matching those photos as close as we can the same as we are matching marilyn's photos so those men like all the dancers in um Gentlemen prefer blondes. Thank you, gentlemen prefer blondes. <laughs> um, they were selected, they were cast because they look like the guys in the original movie and everyone was hand chosen. Lady, first they're cast because they can dance. Yeah, well, <laughs> from, from dancers, from dancers, they were chosen. I, I will to... say as on a hair side of things, I would have preferred them to be um, cast for their hair alone and not their dancing skills as well. <laughs> The same with the band. The women yeah. have to be able to play these instruments. There's no way they're going to find the right hair color, length, and style of yeah. 15 women. But so. they all had wigs in the show anyway. Yeah. You know, in the in the original anyway. So we had a lot of opportunities to play. And we had a we had you know support from not only our regular team, but then we would bring in makeup and hair people. And you know, makeup and hair people, costume people. We love doing period stuff. It's so much fun for us. It's such a great opportunity. Anytime you get that chance, everyone's, you know, you're going to certainly look into it pretty closely. And then add on top of that, it's Marilyn. Come on. <laughs> I mean, I don't think either one of us knew we were getting ourselves into when we said yes. But still, it was wonderful and and awful and wonderful. <laughs> so you filmed back in 2019. What is it like seeing the film after all this time? I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be a vulnerable idiot right now. But... I was uh, terrified the entire time. I, I don't think my my nerves went down when I was just like, okay, and then the date was set, like, oh, my God, the world's actually going to see this now? Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. I was so terrible that even when we were shooting and we had additional hairstylists come and day play, I didn't even want them to see Anna because I just felt like so many people would have been like, I wouldn't have done it like that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and then you've got the world seeing it. And as we were talking before, all these Maryland fans that, you know, I don't want to disappoint them. Also, you've just heard the challenges that we had. So watching it for the first time, all I could see was being reminded of the crazy, insane, hectic days that we had and every mistake I could just see. That's the thing about doing, you know, and most people in in the business, certainly makeup and hair people will say to you is that you have to watch it multiple times because Mm -hmm. the first time you go through and, and you have a narrative in your head of what the day was like, and then you see a mistake and you're like, oh, it's because this, that, and other, or, but in your head, there's a whole nother movie playing. And so you watch it again and you try to not see all your mistakes maybe you see other people's mistakes but you try to not see you know your mistakes maybe the third or the fourth time you actually can view it with some perspective it usually takes a couple times before you get there and you know it was on the big screen it was in theaters before it was on Netflix. So we'd seen it because we got an advanced link to it we'd seen it at home but the at the premiere in Hollywood and it's on a giant screen and it's the audience is filled with people and you know you're still having watching it with your hands over your eyes a little bit because it's the first time we'd seen it so big you just you just hope you get it right and you hope you don't get crucified by, <laughs> by people you know i mean it's funny because we've had so much reaction from this film so many people from all walks of life and all kinds of makeup and hair people have responded to it, whether it's Instagram or or whatever. There's people that they do film and they loved it. There's people that do print and they loved it. There's regular normal people that don't work, do hair or makeup at all. And they loved it. And so we did something right. And I don't think we felt like that a lot of the time, you know, so Maybe it was the pace. Maybe it was the pace. We just never had really a moment to savor anything. We just were moving so fast. So I don't know. Yeah, I think the first time I watched it, I was just critical and judged everything. The second time I watched it, I just couldn't get past Anna's performance and how fucking amazing she was. Because I think while we were shooting, that's not necessarily what I was paying attention to. So when I watched it for that second time and just went, man, she just knocked this out of the park. She's incredible. Yeah. She worked really hard. And 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 like you said, you don't always see that. Some things we saw in the moment, but other things we didn't. Well, her performance is amazing. But when you're doing these iconic roles, clearly the hair and makeup's a big part of it. I'm reminded of roles where it was a distraction, the hair and makeup trying to get someone to look like something else. But in this case, I think it buoyed her performance in a way that makes it unnoticeable. But again, you guys should really be proud of this work. I think it looks fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thanks, we're too. we're definitely proud of it. And you know, one thing that was really interesting while we were doing this, we were shooting in places that Marilyn had lived or been, or, you know, we shot in her home and where she, she died. We shot in her um, home that she lived with her mom. And we, we shot a lot of practical locations that, you know, she'd walk that path. That was also really interesting. This is one of those movies where it's going to challenge the people that watch it and they're going to have to walk her path in a way that they might not be prepared for. It'll be interesting to see, you know, some people will love it and some people will be uncomfortable with it. Well, I'm glad in the end you guys are both comfortable with your work. Thanks so much for sharing behind. On that note, we're going to call it a wrap. Great having you both here. This is a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks, Kid. Thank you so much. Listeners, I always appreciate your feedback. You'll find my contact info at our website, below the line, one word dot biz. That's B-I-Z. You'll also find past episodes and links to all of our social media, so check it out. Ladies, where next are we going to see your work? So the next thing to hit the screens is pretty soon, and that's Babylon for myself. Yeah, and then Oppenheimer, which is Christopher Nolan's uh, mid-next year. We're both in Prague now, working with Anna again. We're working on a John Wick spinoff called Ballerina. So that's what's up for me. A little a little different from now. Yeah, a little different. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit different. Those are all projects I'm looking forward to this. And I hope you guys will consider coming back and telling me more about them. For sure. You know where you can also catch Jamie Lee is on our podcast. Go ahead. Lastlooks.com. <laughs> what is it? Last Looks is the name of it. It's the Last Looks podcast. There you go. I'm in competition with Skid. No. Um. <laughs> I think we have some overlapping audience. 
I speak to um, yeah, hair and makeup people in the film and television industry. So yeah. Whether you're in the industry or you want to be in the industry or you're not in the industry or you're new in the industry or you're old in the industry, it's very interesting. It's it's interesting. <laughs> Period. That's the same pitch that I made. <laughs> the elbowing me. Stop. <laughs> My closing credits, thanks to Curtis Five for our music, John Juan for our logo, and to all of our listeners, I appreciate you. Please rate us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends. Thanks again from Below the Line.